Thank you, Lola, and the organizers for the opportunity to speak with you today. And thank you to my colleague, client, and friend, Suzanne Delascar, for putting my name forward as a public practitioner CPA. Um, I've been in public practice for many decades, and I have a varied experience with many industries, including translators and related businesses. Regardless of the industry, there are basic reporting obligations that apply to all businesses. Whether your translation business is a sole practitioner with employees um, or a larger uh, firm, um, there's some certain basic requirements imposed by Canada Revenue Agency uh, and other outside um, organizations that we do have to comply with as businesses. I hope that this brief presentation will, um, if you're already an up and running business um, of a more going concern with employees, I hope that this brief presentation will um, remind you of certain aspects of your business that maybe you'd like to enhance or improve, or if you're just starting out your translation business, I hope that this presentation and the materials will, will serve as a guide to you. Uh, my contact information is included um, on the handout, and I look forward to hearing from you uh, uh, later if you have any follow-up questions as time goes by. So if you need any help with certain aspects of your operations um, or specific tax questions or ongoing uh, guidance, that's what, what I'm here for. Some basic considerations for your translation business are creating your business. So should you be a self-employed consultant, a sole proprietorship, or a corporation? And it can be very confusing to small business people, but just to frame that up for you, a self-employed consultant is a business that operates just using your own name. A sole proprietorship is a self-employed individual that has registered a, a trade name for their business. A corporation is a completely separate legal entity that's dutifully in, incorporated through the Ministry of Consumer Corporate Affairs. You can incorporate your existing business name. So if you've been operating for a number of years as a sole proprietorship under a specific trade name, maybe Toronto Translations, and your business has grown to a greater extent, and you decide, based on the tax advice of your accountant and your lawyer, that perhaps it's time to incorporate, you could then incorporate Toronto Translations Inc. or Limited. So you wouldn't have to give up your name um, to operate as a corporation. And so the differences between the structures Really, in essence, um, the primary difference, whether you're operating as a self-employed consultant, sole proprietorship, or a corporation, the first consideration is liability. So are the services you are providing going to expose you and your personal wealth and your family's wealth to lawsuit? So are you um, translating something that is so sensitive in nature or so complex that something could go wrong, um, thus holding you liable for a mistranslation? Um, other considerations as to whether you should incorporate from a liability standpoint would be if you now have employees and subcontractors because you just simply cannot control everybody all the time especially if they're going into your customers or um, business associates' place of business or even their homes. Again, a lot of exposure there. So this is where you would want to consult with your lawyer um, and, and, um, and with, with your accountant as well. We're all on the same side of the table for you. The other consideration, aside from liability, as to whether I should incorporate my business or not, has simply to do with tax planning. So at a certain point, um, is my business large enough that I'm generating net surplus? So what I mean by that um, is my, my business is rolling along, I'm, um, I have 
um, earned enough profits in my business that I've now got money in the bank after I've paid my taxes at the end of the year. So if that's the case, now might be a good time to start thinking about incorporating from a tax standpoint because the corporate tax rates are the most attractive in the world. Um, the uh, effective Ontario corporate tax rate for a CCPC, which stands for a Canadian Controlled Private Corporation, is the astoundingly low rate of 15.7% on your total operating income retained in the company of up to 400,000. So you can see why everybody wants to be a CCPC, but only us Canadians can be, and it's very strictly controlled. Um, so really the key from a tax standpoint is, am I leaving, do I have money left over? Because if you have to take out everything that you are earning to live on, which most Canadians are operating their business for income, so if you, if you have to take out all of your earnings to live on, then there's no point in incorporating. Revenue Canada takes the view from a tax standpoint that once those earnings are in the hands of the shareholder, i.e. If you've drawn out all of the earnings to live on, it's taxable at your personal tax rate. There are certain things we can do, dividends um, and, and a few minor things that could um, that could um, uh, delay the, the uh, declaration of that income by certain um, tax accruals that are allowed. But at the end of the day, very simply, if you have to take out and use everything you're earning, then there's really no point to being incorporated. So that's kind of the key from a tax standpoint. Now that we've decided on the most appropriate business structure, then you would proceed to register your business. And the uh, trade name registration has to do with Ministry of Consumer Corporate Relations, not Canada Revenue Agency. So that's MCCR on the, uh, the internet. Uh, so Ministry of Consumer Corporate Relations. So for $65, you can register a trade name other than your own name. So if you decide that for privacy reasons or other professional reasons, that you would like to use something other than your own name, it's a very simple process to do. And um, you would then register your name and you, you then are a sole proprietorship. Your reporting does not change in terms of um, how you are um, reporting your income and what you are deducting as expenses. Um, that is exactly the same. It's just that you are now operating under a trade name. If you decide to go the incorporation route following the advice of your lawyer and accountant, um, the basic cost to incorporate uh, through the Ministry of Consumer Corporate Relations is $350. So that's the ministry fee, whether you do that yourself online or engage an accountant or your lawyer to assist with that. So that's the basic ministry fee. Um, and if at the same time as you incorporate, you want to register a name, uh, that would be an additional $65. Uh, and then from there, um, if you decide that you want to go ahead and get your minute books and other basic supplies, that's about another $150. And then you're looking at a very um, um, basic um, fee for your lawyer and or accountant to set that up. Um, that would be a very, um, like a very basic um, legal service that Susanna or I would provide would be an incorporation. So that's a rough outline of the costs, whether you decide to do it yourself or engage professionals to assist you. Um, once you do incorporate, uh, that incorporation is a separate legal entity. It files its separate tax returns called a T2. So those must be prepared um, in, in a particular format by the uh, tax accountants. One of the um, uh, considerations uh, that are, um, are related to Canada Revenue Agency is registering for your HST. So it doesn't matter the structure, if you're self-employed, sole proprietorship, or incorporated, the HST rules apply to any entity, so any business, regardless of your corporate structure. 
And the law says that as soon as you hit the $30,000 gross revenues the first year, you must register for HST and start charging ST, HST on all of your services from then on. So the next year, if your revenues drop, say, to twenty or 15000 you can't just voluntarily opt out. So once you're registered, you must stay registered and comply with all of the reporting requirements. Um, once you are registered, you must charge 13% on all of your gross sales to your customers, and you therefore are eligible to deduct what we call the ITCs, or the amount that you pay out on HST against what you collected. Um, we do find that consultants like yourself and other professionals, um, you know, fortunately you do get to keep most of what you earn, uh, which uh, translates across on the HST side as well, so you normally are always in a position that you would always owe HST. So it's a very good thing to work with your accountant to budget for that. So it's not voluntary. Again, once we hit that 30000 a year threshold, we must register and stay registered. And it's another cash flow consideration that we now have to take into account. Yeah. One thing that I would mention. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I just, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. I'll just wrap that up really quickly then. The, the one thing, the final thing that I'll just say on the HST, and I have um, some translating clients here today, which is great, um, is that some of the work you do actually would be of a global nature. So you might be sitting behind your computer here in Toronto, uh, but providing translation services to a global um, client. So depending on um, that and other criteria of the engagement, such as um, where they are located, where their business is controlled from, and if you are being paid in, in US funds or English pounds, that the, you would not charge HST on those services. So like anything to do with the government, uh, we would never take anything um, uh, you know, at face value, so if there's any type of um, irregular type of service or anything unique, to the services that you are providing, that's something that we would want to look at um, independently. So I'll just pass on my uh, the, uh, the mic to Suzanne, and thank you very much. Yes, well, what we are planning to do is actually to do the three presentations and then leave for the questions because they are related. So we have the lawyer and then we have also the finance part. So if we can have the questions at the end. So a few of you heard a couple of years ago, actually Suzanne was one of our speakers. She's a lawyer and a translator, so she has a very nice insight about our profession. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks, Lola, and uh, it's great to be back again. I was um, here in 2014 and then uh, I was a presenter in 2015, and uh, I was registered to come last year, but something happened I couldn't come, so I'm glad to be back here again uh, this year. And uh, I just want to thank my esteemed panelists as well for being here. And, uh, as a lawyer, you get a lot of financial questions, and I know nothing about that. So, you know, that's why we have accountants and we have people who are working in the investment industry. So, uh, I'm going to talk today about legal issues affecting uh, translators and interpreters here in Ontario. So, one of the things that I believe is really important um, as a lawyer linguist is that. Um, I can see you know, issues in both professions, but also where they connect. And that's what really motivates me in my work. And one of the things that uh, I notice a lot of times in working with business owners, whether they're translators, interpreters, or, or not, is that there are a lot of legal issues that could affect you uh, that are not just related to your specific work that you're doing. And I really believe in that saying that no man is an island. So, 
there's one thing going on in your life here, it's going to affect the other parts of your life as well, including possibly your business, unfortunately. Now, the positive thing is, is that if you are aware of potential issues that could come up, you can address them early on, or better yet, prevent them from turning into something much bigger than you want. So I'm just going to touch on a few issues today um, with regard to being a, a transit or interpreter in Ontario and the kind of legal issues that you should just be aware of as you're operating in your businesses and your personal lives, because that's important. So you're going to get a copy of uh, this uh, presentation by email, so not to worry, sit back and relax, you can make some notes if you want to, but uh, we're going to touch on a number of topics. So first thing I want to touch on um, is liability insurance and the language services professional. And the reason why I wanted to address this issue is because when I look at a lot of the messages I see on a lot of listservs that are frequented by transit interpreters, there's a lot of questions about what this really means. And one of the things that's important uh, to remember is that we are connecting ourselves as business owners. Even if you might not have it in your mindset, what is it to think, I'm a transit or interpreter, but I'm also running a business. So it's always important to keep that in mind. So when we talk about liability insurance, we're talking about insurance that you would purchase as a business owner to cover the activities and the provision of services that you are providing to your clients. And this is so that if there's some sort of problem that arises and there's some sort of claim made, that you would have insurance to cover <coughs> those issues. It's no different than you know, when we purchase auto insurance, for example. Um, or if we're traveling abroad, we purchase insurance for uh, if we get sick in another country. So you're just protecting yourself in that, in, in the event that there's a problem. So the first one I'm just to touch on was to debunk the deep pockets myth. A lot of people say to me, well, I'm just a small player in, in the translation industry, so nobody would ever kind of go after me. They would go after the big institution or you know, the big company or someone who was wealthier. So it's true, there is something called the deep pockets in law. We're looking, if there's a problem, who do we want to go after? Somebody who has nothing or an institution that had lots? Of course, someone who has something to pay. But initially, typically, you also would go after everyone who might have contributed to the problem. So there's still that potential that, at least in the beginning, someone who considers themselves maybe a small player could wind up being still involved. This is not to scare anyone, it's just to be aware of potentialities. Okay, some other things you want to think about when you think about liability insurance is do clients come to your premises? Um, so, you know, some of us, even as translators, we do official document translation, they have to do, you know, they need a certified copy of the original, um, certified translation, I have to say, they're coming to your premises, what if they trip and fall? Um, that's a different type of insurance, but it's insurance nonetheless to protect you if there's an issue, okay? Another thing too, do you use your car to carry out business activities? If you don't tell the insurer that you use your car for business activities and there's a problem in the course of you carrying out your business, they could decide to reject the claim. Another thing to think about, do your clients require you to carry errors and emissions insurance? So if there's a problem with the translation or the interpretation, did the client say to you, you have to carry this insurance? If they said that, and you don't, and there's a problem, they may not want to cover you under their insurance, for example. Last point with regard to liability insurance. There's a lot of different options out there for linguists. I think the translation industry for a long time was kind of cut out from the insurance industry in the sense that the insurance industry didn't really know what we did. <laughs> But now there's specialized options through different certifying organizations. So I know ATA has a, um, a plan, for example. And I know a lot of you are certified by different organizations. So I would look there first. Okay, the next thing I want to touch on is, is business structures. And I think Elizabeth did a great job talking about that already. The most important thing for me is just to remember that when you're looking at running your business, there's the accounting side and there's the legal side of things. And accountants and lawyers work together very, very closely. We do a lot of cross referrals. So if you're looking at it from the tax perspective, also think about it from the legal perspective. 
So for example, if you're wanting to register a certain name, there's intellectual property issues, for example. You can't use someone else's name that's already been taken. And that's something that a lawyer would help you with. Um, also to set up the corporate structure and also to keep up with your filings with the government. That's something else that a lawyer would help you with too. Okay, sometimes we have what we call commercial disputes in life. And if we can avoid them, that's great. But sometimes they arise. And what we would try to do as much as possible, I know this might be shocking to you, but as lawyers, we are bound under the rules of professional conduct to try and offer our clients ways to settle matters, not to try and take them to court. I know you find that, might find that shocking, but it's true. <laughs> and not only that, in certain areas of law, for example, family law, 85% of, of family law matters never make it to trial. They all settle. Most matters overall in law never make it to trial. So there is this push in the profession and just in the legal system generally to settle matters. It makes sense financially and also emotionally for people. So if you have an issue with a supplier, a contractor, client, whatever it might be, it's a couple of different options that you have to settle a dispute. First of all, informal negotiation. You don't have to run to go see a lawyer the minute there's a problem. As a matter of fact, most contracts will say if there's a problem with, between two parties, the first step is to try and sort it out between yourselves and see if you can do it that way. Other options if that doesn't work are mediation and arbitration. They're called alternative dispute resolution um, methods. What mediation does is it allows you to try and settle the matter outside of court, but it's not binding. So you decide after mediation you can change your mind. Arbitration is different. Arbitration is where you sign an agreement saying, I agree to whatever the third party arbitrator says, and I can't appeal this to court. If you decide not to go to the arbitration route, you can take it to court. If you have a claim that's under $25,000 of small claims, $25,000 or more, you go into the regular um, uh, system through the Superior Court of Justice. Okay, here's something that comes up a lot with translators and interpreters. And, um, the question is, am I just helping my clients or engaging in the practice of law? Here's to know. My barber's smiling at me. So we had a conversation a couple years ago, <laughs> and I'm going to put Barbara on the spot here, and she had brought up an issue that I thought was really important. And what she found, and what a few other interpreters actually found, was that they were becoming the go-to people in their community. And so not only were they being you know, uh, approached for language services, but they also wanted to find out about well, how do I apply to be a permanent resident? Or how do I go to court on this matter? And so this person was becoming a village lawyer. And they were one of feeling like they had to tell people what to do, even though they weren't practicing law. So this will happen sometimes, especially if you are working in a language pair that is you know, rather unique, um, where you don't have a lot of speakers, and you have this one community, they might rely on you to help. So what I want to touch on is just the different roles and different legal professions that you might come into contact with uh, as translators and interpreters. And I'm sure most of you have had contact with legal professionals, hopefully for positive reasons, but who knows. <laughs> so notaries public are individuals, at least in Ontario, they're the ones who can certify true copies of documents, attest to someone's identity. Um, that term, in different countries, different jurisdictions, has different meanings. So in Ontario, you have to be a lawyer to be in a republic, but if you go to the United States, you don't have to have that license. Anybody can decide to study to be in a republic and get that uh, qualification. Notaries are individuals in other jurisdictions, they just do what we call non-contentious legal matters. So drafting wills, real estate transactions, but they don't go to court, and they're not necessarily lawyers. Paralegals in Ontario um, are licensed legal professionals, but they provide specific legal services, and they cannot go to court on a, a number of different matters. And then um, we also have commission oaths. They take oaths for affidavits, and then regulated Canadian immigration consultants. They can actually advise individuals on immigration matters. So you will get the PDF, and you'll see this list of different ways to protect yourself. But the main thing is this. You don't want to become someone who is giving out advice that you're not licensed to 
QL, because otherwise you'd be held liable for it. So if, if in doubt, the best thing is to refer it out. That's what I say. If in doubt, refer it out. <laughs> Just a couple more topics and I'll be done. One of the things I want to remind you of is that just on a personal basis and a business basis, you should have your estate planning documents in order. So you should have a will, you should have powers of attorney, and your will will deal with your estate, which is all the assets that you have upon your death. Okay? I know it sounds morbid, but it's something to remember. Finally, you may have a family law issue arise in your life. Hopefully not, but unfortunately, it's very, very common. And if something does happen, you have a lot of different options to sort it out. And you might think it's strange that I'm bringing this up, but a family law matter can totally change someone's complete, like their life completely. Turn it upside down. If it's not handled appropriately. So a lot of things that you can do, but again, you don't have to go to court to settle everything. Now, what I'm going to show you now is just a list of different sources that you can access to get legal help. There's a lot of information online. Of course, it's not customized to your situation, but it's a good start because it makes sure that you're informed of what's out there. So go to the courthouse, go to the Law Society to get a referral, go to um, immigrant newcomer organizations, they have a lot of information out there. So thanks for having me again, and I'll be happy to answer questions after that. panel is uh, David Milner. He is an investment and retirement planner at Royal Bank of Canada, and he was a financial advisor at BMO before, so a lot of experience in the financial area. So thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Lola. Thanks for having me today. Thanks to the two ladies on my panel uh, to make me look a little smarter than I probably am. And uh, thanks to all of you to uh, coming out and giving up your Saturday to uh, come listen to us speak. So I'm going to talk a little bit basics about sort of uh, investing 101, maybe a little remedial to uh, some of you, but uh, given that a recent study it showed that less than 35% of Canadians have an RSP, um, there's probably a few of you in the room that, uh, that may get something out of it. So you want to get started investing as early as possible. Um, part of the reasons why that people don't do it they haven't started is that I can't afford it, there's nothing left to give. I don't have enough money yet saved up to justify getting into invest. And I'm not sure what to invest in. There's tons of options out there, not quite sure what to do. Um, and it can be a little intimidating at times. So I want to kind of go through these three things and try and make it simple and hopefully, you know, open your eyes to the ability of you know, getting, getting the process started. So first of all, benefits of compound growth, uh, very important here. Um, to my point with starting early, you can have two scenarios uh, here. Someone starts 10 years prior, some someone starts 10 years after. So this scenario just shows basically 25 years of investing, um, investing $50 a month into an RSP plan. At a 6% rate of return, you can see by starting 10 years earlier, you're going to have twice as much money as you would waiting an additional 10 years. And that's only $50, $50 a month into an RSP account. Another benefit that doing regular contributions has is the benefit of dollar cost averaging. So when you put money into investments such as a mutual fund, the price will fluctuate on a daily basis. And a lot of investors always come to me and say, well, Dave, when is the right time to invest? When should I put my money in? When should I start? And I have no idea. If I did, I'd be a very rich man. But the reality is, is that no one knows. Not even the professionals that we pay to manage all these funds and so on have any real idea where the markets are going. They can use data to give you know, their best guess plan and have a strategy in place. But no one really knows when the market's going up or down. But by investing on a regular basis, you not only take advantage of when the market is low, um, you can also avoid putting money in at one time and taking a big hit. If you put in an investment in January and the markets are down for the next four months, you're, you're starting yourself off at a rough spot. 
Whereas, if you were doing a small contribution bit by bit, you would not only not lose as much at the start, but also be taking advantage of the lower prices as they come back up. So putting in regular amounts is a good way to maximize your savings. So we live in Canada, which is a lovely country, but it's uh, pretty expensive to, uh, to live here. So here are some freebies that the government kind of gives us, because um, they don't give us many. Uh, these are the types of accounts that you can invest in, a few of them, that actually provide a tax savings for you. So a lot of people are probably going to be very familiar with a lot of these names, but I'm just going to go through them quickly and give you a few bites. So tax-free savings accounts. These are a relatively new account, came out in 2009. Um, they're actually an excellent, excellent account um, for not only business owners, but people with salaries. They, they allow you to contribute right now to $5,500 a year into them, and the money will then grow tax-free in that plan. Now, the banks all have done a terrible job of marketing and, and, and providing these products to, to the Canadian public. RBC is not, you know, we're, we're just to blame just as bad. What we've done is we've basically told everyone to open up a tax-free account and start an automatic payment or something like that, and for the most part, it's going into a savings account within that TFSA, which is earning anywhere from a quarter to half a percent of interest, which basically doesn't do you any justice. You're not saving any tax because you're not growing it. You might as well have that money in a standard bank account um, because if you don't have anything that's actually going to create growth for you, the tax-free savings account doesn't, doesn't benefit. I see every single day in front of me people come in with their tax-free savings account, think they're doing a great job of saving, and sitting there doing nothing for them. So you want to get into something that's actually going to grow and provide that tax savings for you. Um, the nice thing about these accounts, you put money in, you take money out, you pay nothing of it. I put $5,000 in, take it out in 10 years, it's grown to $10,000. I don't pay a single dime on that growth of doubling my money. The other great thing is that when you take it out, you actually get your contribution room back. So you have $5,500 a year, but if you take out, if you put in 55 this year, you make some money, you take it out, you'll actually get that contribution room back so you can put it back in again. You can also make up for lost years. So if you don't have a TFSA yet and you want to start one, you can go back and make up for years that you've missed. So a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, saving strategy. But if you're going to do it, do it for the right reason. Do it for long-term savings. A lot of people are opening these accounts because they want to go on a vacation to wherever. That's fine. You can use it for that. But it really serves no purpose for the, what, what it was designed to do. So here's the difference of what a TFSA can do for you if you've got money outside of the TFSA and inside. So you can see that they're assuming that you're making a $5,000 contribution. My presentation is a little out of date because the contribution limit used to be $5,000. It's not $5,500. An annual earning of 6%. So that's, that's compound growth uh, within a TFSA. So within 10 years, you can see the difference there is about $7,000 between $6,200 and $6,900, or $62,000 and $69,000. But if you look at 20 years, you're talking about savings of almost $40,000. So 20 years, putting in the contribution amount into a TFSA is not only going to grow to a fantastic sum, but you're going to save over $40,000 in tax that you would be doling out otherwise. RSP plans. A lot of people, I'm sure, have an RSP in the room. Um, I find RSPs are very, un people don't quite understand RSPs too well. These are not tax savings accounts, these are tax deferral accounts. The idea of an RSP is you put money in while you have a high earning, while you're working and you're making money, to get a tax break, to lower your income and get a tax break while you're working. And then withdraw the funds when you're retired and you no longer have that paycheck. And the idea is that when you take it out, you are taking it out when you have no income and your income is lower and you will pay less tax on it which is a fantastic plan, but people don't always use that. And it also may not, for business owners, be the best way to save. Because a lot of times business owners don't take out a large amount or, or claim a lot of income. They don't take uh, income out of the business for themselves as much. And the RSP may not be the best place to put investments. 
Because then in our retirement, not only do you have to take money out of your RSP, but you're also taking money out of your company, and you almost can create a situation where you've got to pay tax on too much of it. So you put it in, you get a tax deduction. When you take it out, it is fully taxable at 100% income. So you've got to remember that. And at the age of 71, you not only can no longer contribute to an RSP, but the government actually makes you start to withdraw from it. There's a minimum payment in which you have to take out at that age. So a very good savings plan, because while the money's in your RSP, it grows tax-free. But you've got to understand what the, what the purpose is. We get lots of people come in, put money in their RSP, and then they come back and say, oh, something happens, I need to take money out. And then they realize that they owe tax on the money that they're withdrawing. And they're, why, why, do I, it's my money. But they don't, they've got to be used correctly. Our ESPs, Educational Savings Plan. So for those of you with kids, uh, I know I haven't yet, but I'm sure I will start to lose sleep over the cost of what my children's education is going to cost me. Because it's going to be tens, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. To I have two daughters to put both of those loving, terror, money draining <laughs> people through university at some point. And so, of all the accounts, this is the one where the government actually gives you money. They actually put money into this account for you if you put money in. So an RESP, you can open up for your children, put in $2,500 per year, and the government will give you a 25% in bonds and, and uh, government grants that will add up to a lifetime of $7,200. So I don't know about you, but if the government's going to offer me $7,200 to help pay for my kids' education, I'm going to try and take advantage of that as best I can. Um, again, in this type of account, you can go back and make up for missed years, but you can only do it sort of a year at a time, so there is parameters around that. But these things are 20% rate of return. I've got nothing I can offer you that can get you a guaranteed 20% rate of return. And this is what you've got in this right here. So if you have kids, if they're going to university, I strongly, strongly suggest get one of these open, start putting a monthly contribution in it, and let the government help pay for some of the kids' education. Very important. And then, oh, so in your TFSA, your RSP, and your RESP, as I was talking about before, compound growth and so on, you can start a TFSA, RESP, RRSP, MATIC, at RBC, at any bank, for as low as $25 a month. Which I know going back to the reasons why we don't invest, saying I don't have enough. Well, you know, $25 a month is, if you go through and do a little budget, keep your receipts for a month, I can guarantee you can probably find $25 a month. If you can find more, that's even better. But there's no, you know, a lot of the investments that we have, you don't have to have $10,000, $20,000 to begin with. 25 bucks a month will get you started. And you'd be surprised at how quickly it will accumulate. Um, so here's the, here's some of, again, some of the math. So 35 years, um, age of retirement at 65, monthly contributions made $150 per month, and a rate of return at 7%. So you can see the growth there. Uh, monthly contributions of $150, I can't quite see it, but it's 182000 and if you do bi-weekly, kind of like your mortgage payments, you double up more often at 75 bucks a month, 198. So $200,000 of just making $150 contributions every month into an RSV ETF. So, so it, does, it does grow. Um, finally, a little plug here that, you know, myself or any RBC advice, go, go to the banks. The, the, you know, whether you deal with RBC, whether you deal with TD Scotia, you know, they've got people like myself, they've got people that can help you out, that can do a budget for you, that can help you with, there's so many tools. Go online to your online banking. They, they have budget calculators where they will go through and look at everything you use your debit and credit card for and will break it down by category and show you exactly how much you're spending every month. These tools are so underutilized but can be so powerful to go through and demonstrate where there might be an opportunity in which you can cut back and save some money and put money away. Um, and as I said, you know, I know going into the bank is often the last thing in the world you want to do, and we often have terrible hours that you can't get to. But if you can book an appointment and go in, a lot of times you'll find it'll be, it'll be worth your while because there is many things we can do. Consolidating debt, all the rest, it's, it's worth a visit. 
And then as far as what do we put into, there is you know, a million things. There's stocks, mutual funds, GICs, bonds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, it's, it's confusing and difficult, but we can, you know, we can sit you down, go through, ask you what your risk tolerance is, what you're looking for, and put you in the right investment that will help, help you earn money for retirement. So there's something from RBC saying that uh, everyone is different, everyone's situation is different, and everything I said, they won't stand behind. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. So thank you very much. Now, uh, just a reminder of one mention in the morning. When you ask your questions, please do it to the point, as short as you can. We have allocated full half an hour just for Q&A, because I am sure that you have a lot of questions about this, like the finance area. And I want to make sure that everyone speaks on a mic. So actually, how do I do this with these two mics? Um, can you speak? Can you speak? Yeah, I'll bring the mic to the table, but you will not have a mic. Yeah. Maybe you can come here? Oh, I can yell. You can yell? <laughs> so I'll, bring, I'll bring the mic. For students, especially now, because our, our um, tuition is increasing every year. So for me to put in twenty-five dollars, I'm already in negatives. I'm in negative five digits. <laughs> so, what type of advice do you have for students? I mean, there are a couple of other students here with me, and they're doing a master's program, which is even more expensive. Yes. So. Um... Yeah, an education, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Until you've done it, and you owe money for it, right? So, uh, yeah, it is a tough, it is a tough uh, um, thing. When, when money is tight, I understand. And yeah, your costs are going up, and you may not have an income currently uh, because of your studies. Uh, so, the, you know, I don't have a perfect answer for it, but I do have some things that, that um, you know, you may look at. So. First of all, I can say keep your receipts for a month. Like, use your credit card, your debit card, credit card for everything. Don't take cash out and spend cash because you take $200 out and the next thing you know it's gone, right? And you can't remember what you spent it on. So everything you purchase for a month, get a receipt for, whether it's a coffee at Tim Hortons or whatever, and, and do that. And then at the end of the month, go through all of those receipts. Or don't even, don't even keep the receipts if you want. If you just use your debit card or your credit card, you can go online, you know, you use your debit card, you go into your bank account, you can pull up a 30 month history of exactly what you spent your money on. So I guarantee you, I know being a student is tough and I know you're eating ramen noodles and all the rest <laughs> uh, seven times a, a week, but you know, you'd be surprised at how many little things, coffee, coffee is, is you know, is the one. Like, my wife, my God. <laughs> when I see, when I see our, 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 our joint account, and it's just Starbucks, 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 Starbucks. Uh, you, know, I, I, you know, it just shakes my head. Uh, lunches, and I know students usually skip lunches and all the rest, but that's another place that's an easy thing. Make coffee at home, uh, bring it in a thermos, make your lunch, pack it every day. You, you'd be surprised that you know, $25 is not a lot. For my wife, it's usually lunch and 100 coffee, so, uh, a day. So, um, you know, it, 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 I, I really feel for students. I, I, I said to myself, you know, losing sleep, I'm not joking. It's it, educational costs are just, you know, um, terrible. And um, it, it, it's tough, and I don't have the right answer. But if you do that practice, you know, just go through on a monthly basis, you'd be surprised where you kind of go, oh, you know what? Maybe that's not bad. Oh, you know what? That's not bad. And the good thing that I will say is that if you are a student and you are young, maybe you can't do it while you're in school now, but as soon as you're out and as soon as you get that job, go into, you know, as I said, RBC or any of the banks, I don't care, and just set yourself up a TFSA, set yourself up an RSP account, 
and start putting money in because the sooner you stop, it will make a huge difference. And put the money in and forget about it. Don't think it's there for a rainy day or it's there for this. It's not there for that. It's there for when you're 65 and when your paycheck is no longer coming in the door. So that's, I don't have a great answer, but that's the best I can do. Thank you. <laughs> I received some income from a U.S. company uh, for interpretation. Then the taxes should be filed with uh, CRA, or should I file taxes with U.S.? And that's a very good question, and thanks for raising that. Um, so, as a Canadian citizen and resident of Canada, um, you have to file your worldwide income to Canada. So um, if, if the um, client that you did the work for in the U.S. was required to do a withholding, and some of them are for subcontractors and business to business, then when we file your Canadian tax return, you get a credit for that foreign tax withheld. So you do get a credit for that as if you had paid it in Canada. And there's a lot of um, cross-border in, um, uh, information sharing between the IRS and Canada. So very good point that you raised because you do want to be on site with that, you know, to, to properly report it. Uh, just to continue the same question, uh, what about Canada, what about the HST? I mean, uh, I have clients in Quebec and, uh, for example, in Alberta, and in Alberta they have the GST, and as soon as I uh, start telling them that uh, I charge HST, they say, no, we will not pay 13%, we will pay 6% of GST. So, how does it work? That's a very good question, and you're quite right. Some of the provinces do have different tax rates, so you're going to charge the HST that is, is relevant to the consumer. So for instance, DC as well does not have the federal portion. So the amount you're going to charge them would be 8%. And by the way, they keep changing their mind, BC. So, <laughs> so yeah, you can get the, uh, the exact rates to charge just by Googling it online. So you can say HST by province, and it'll pop right up. And that's what you have to um, charge the client that's located in PEI has a different rate. Um, um, in particular, um, uh, Alberta only has the financial side. BC has a different rate as well, which they again they tinker with it from year to year. So that's the best the best bet. Go online, see what the, the applicable provincial rate is, and that's what you charge. And of course, just keep your records. You know, the breakdown on your spreadsheet or your invoices. Questions? I can try and be loud. If, um, as you're registered with an HST number, if um, you're charging another province's tax rate, do you need to be registered in that province? No, and that's a very good question as well. And you have to be registered to do business in other provinces unless you've got a physical location there. So if you've got a physical permanent location, as you know, you rent or you own a property, then you do have to register provincially. But otherwise, it's okay for you to be located in Toronto, but provide services um, interprovincially or globally as long as you're um, charging the applicable rates. And since it's a federal program, you're just remitting it to one party, which is um, the federal government, unless it's too bad. And then you can get into a two-tier reporting um, for the payroll, for instance. So. so you are charging the rate of the consumer's province but you're citing your own Ontario HST account number? Yes, because it's a federal number. Yes, that's okay. correct. Yeah. So it's a federal program, and you're remitting it only to Canada Revenue Agency. 
So um, it's up to us to keep the books and records. So Carbon New Canada came along and said, okay, you made a thousand dollars in sales, uh, but you only showed that you charged, um, you know, say ten percent instead of thirteen. And the reason is, is because some of my business was for a client that was located in BC who had a rate of five percent or eight percent. Um, so it's up to us to keep the books on it. And Revenue Canada would look and say, okay, that's fine. So in that case, could you just charge this service tax, <coughs> for example, if there is a 5% tax in BC, do you charge uh, the service tax uh, here of 8%, I believe it is? No, so you would just, so if you're providing a, um, uh, so you're providing a translation service um, to a client that is located in, in BC, you're going to be charging them the HST applicable to that province. And, and I didn't mean to confuse you there, mm -hmm. but BC has changed its rate a few times over the years. They were 5%, then 8%. So it's, it's just a, a quirk of BC that they had changed their applicable rate a few times. So it's always best just to Google it and just, just Google HST by province, and, and it'll tell you the exact applicable rates currently. So there's some play in the rates. But there's some provinces that don't have an HST, but do you charge the GST or how does that work? So you, you would charge the applicable, so what, it used to be called um, PST for provincial sales tax and GST for goods and sales tax. And so the government chose to unify that and so it's called HST or for Harmonized Sales Tax, recognizing that depending on which province you are in, there could be a different rate. So you're quite right, some of the provinces have opted out on either the federal or the provincial um, rate. And as, uh, as the service provider, you know, who cares which it was, as long as you're charging the, the correct applicable rate for that province and just remitting it as normal on your HST return, which is a federal program. Thank you. This is for Suzanne. Suzanne, what happens if you die and you don't have, <laughs> I'm killing everybody in here. Um, what happens if you die and you don't have a will in place? Does everything just automatically go to your children, or is it taken by the government, or what happens in that situation? Great question. We get that all the time. So, if you don't have a will, may I add also if whatever you leave is negative, also what happens with that? Okay, sure. I will. If whatever you leave behind you is negative and not positive, just in case. Because they don't take nominees here in Canada, and uh, I think the person has to be physically present to sign the documents. Okay, so I'm going to talk about dying intestate, the solvent estate, and safety deposit box. So in Ontario, we have uh, um, a piece of legislation called the Succession Law Reform Act that applies to situations where someone dies without a will. If you die without a will, it's called dying intestate. So without the last will in testament. So your will is simply a written document that sets out how you want your assets distributed upon your death. Your estate is everything that you own on your death, as well as all liabilities that you have on your death. So the gentleman over here referred, asked about what happens if you have a negative estate, meaning you have more debts than assets. So then your estate would be considered insolvent. There's nothing there. And that happens actually more often than you can believe. People might have a lot of assets, but they have a lot of debts as well. And so your assets first have to cover all the debts that you owed at the time of your death, and 
And sometimes the assets don't cover all the liabilities, so there's nothing there. It's a negative estate. It's an insolvent estate, I should say. So if you don't have a last will and testament, the Succession Law Reform Act sets out how your assets are distributed upon your death. So basically speaking, because there's a lot of different scenarios, but first what the government says is that if you pass away and you are married, your spouse gets the first $200,000 of your estate, and then your spouse and your children divide up the rest. Now, if there's no children, then everything would just go to your spouse. Now, let's say you have no spouse, he has children, it gets divided amongst your children. Let's say you have no spouse and no children, it goes up to your parents. No parents that survive you, then it'll go to your siblings. No siblings, these and that. So you see there's a hierarchy. They'll keep looking for someone who is next of kin to inherit from your estate. So that's the way it works. So <laughs> even though a lot of people say, well, we'll just go to the government or the government will sort it out, oftentimes what happens is people don't realize, yes, the laws do take care of you, often not in the way that you would like. So that's something to remember. But who is this person who takes care of all this? Okay, so if you have a will, the person who takes care of distributing your assets and tying up all the issues is called an executor or the estate trustee. Both terms are being used. The estate trustee is more modern, but we still use executor. And this is the person who's named in your will. They take your will upon your death, and they carry out all the instructions in your will. So they take care of what we call the administration and settling of your estate. But if there's no will, it doesn't. So then what happens is there's two things that happen. There's no will. Usually, a family member steps up. So if there was a spouse, because a lot of people who are married um, or have kids don't have a will. Almost 50% of people in Canada don't have a will. Okay? Who should have one? So uh, usually the spouse will step up, or a child, an adult child, or you know, niece or nephew, or someone else. They will step up and say, I will act as a state trustee. They might have to go through a court process to be appointed as a state trustee. But if nobody does it, then a government department called the Public Guardian and Trustee, the PGT, they get involved. And one of their functions is to take care of estates where there's no estate trustee, but the estate has to be settled in some way. So that's what happens. So guys, just to piggyback on that, get a will. <laughs> <laughs> because everyone hates the banks, you want to really hate the bank, show up to the bank with a death certificate and no will. Because if you come in and say, I've got no proof that I'm the person that's supposed to be taking care of my dead husband, mother, father's estate, and there's no will, we are not to, we don't write checks to people we don't, hasn't said this is the person to do it to. And it will make your life miserable. So David, what do you tell people who come in with that? What do you tell them they have to do? Well, so I, I usually send them to a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> You know, good luck, but they have to, yeah, they have to go. We need some document from the court to say, yes, this person is the person that you can talk to about the accounts, about the safety deposit box, whatever the case may be. So get a will. If you have, if you're married and you have kids, get a will, get a power of attorney, because it will make your life. And when you, in your will, when you name the executor, tell that person they're the executor. You would not believe how many people show up and go, I just found out I'm the executor of someone's, you know, will. And also tell those people where everything is. Yeah. Tell them where you bank. Tell them where your investments are. Tell them where the safety deposit is. Tell them all this stuff. Because every day I get someone coming through the door going, my father's died, he's got this statement that's five years old from RBC, is the account still there? And I say, it might be, but I can't tell you that. So what happens in that situation is when somebody doesn't have a will, well, of course, a family member or a friend wants to step up and settle the estate. But what happens is the banks can't just give anybody that information. The privacy laws of the banks in particular are so strict, and with, for good reason. So what happens is people say, well, I think there's a whole bunch of money in there, but the bank's not going to tell me. So then what happens is we have to go through this process in court to get you officially appointed. Only when you have a certificate will the bank speak to you. Well, that can take several months depending on your jurisdiction. Sometimes even in Toronto, it can take a year to get it. So especially when there's an urgent situation where family members, kids need access to that money, especially minor children, it can be disastrous. 
So, Kowal, I just wanted to address the issue you had with the safety deposit box. Can you clarify your question? You had a question about the safety deposit box? So, Kowal, well, you had a question about this. No, this was just that if I have a safety deposit box, and do I have to mention it in my will that I have a safety deposit box? And if there is no will, then what happens to the box? Okay, so I'm going to get David to comment on it as well from the bank perspective. But yes, when people do a will, we, do, we have them fill in an intake form. And that's one of the questions is, do you have a safety deposit box? Because a lot of people put in for important information in their safety deposit box, including oftentimes their original will. So we do ask about that. And by noting that in the will, then your state trustee knows what to look for. So, and when you come to the bank, so in the, in the case of, of, of no will, we would refer you back to a lawyer, but if you do have a will and there, the executive does come in, we will allow you to go into the safety deposit box and open it and see what's in there, but you can't take it. Not until the, the, the will and the estate is probated and you come back to us with those probate documents and the probate is the courts basically saying, we, we feel that this will is the last, you know, the only will that, uh, of this person, and they sign off on it, and after that point, then the executor has the right to come in and disperse the assets, but you yeah. you can't even do it prior to that. And we have Margaret has uh, one question, maybe that could be the last question, because we are already over the the next presentation, so Margaret? I just found out through family, we were going through a situation that this document was actually sent to the This stuff has to happen fairly quickly, so try and get someone that is, you know, somewhat savvy and stoic. Yes. Absolutely, and I can just make a final comment to completely um, underscore that um, Suzanne and, and David's statement is that as an executor and trustee, it's your obligation to wrap up the estate. So a lot of people don't realize that depending on um, when the, the person dies, you do have to file that final return within six months. And if you don't, the penalties to the estate, i.e. the balance of the um, bulk rent, uh, available for inheritance can be huge. So there's a lot of responsibilities and those final tax returns um, are very complex um, and, and, and um, they have a different reporting timeline than the regular personal tax year. Thank you so much, the three panelists, and I think we got a lot of great information to work on our finances. Thank you.